Good day and welcome to this Good Friday worship service. This service has a different tone than a typical service here at St. Giles, and it is more somber, more reflective, more prayerful, and probably more meditative than you might expect or might encounter from us. At the end of the service, we will have music and invite you to stay as long as you would like in prayerful meditation or silent reflection as you carry the story and ponder what happens in this space. If at any point you need to leave or find a restroom or take care of yourself in any way, restrooms are out the hall and down that direction. If you would like any information or to share a prayer concern with us, there is a black folder that you can write down your name and address and a way for us to contact you and we're glad to pray with you, to tell you more about who we are, or help with whatever you might need help with. I think that's all you need to get through the service together, but continue to welcome each other and care for another as we reflect and celebrate and mourn on this holy day. Christ Jesus bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, look with mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given over to the hands of sinners and to suffer death on the cross who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Please be seated as we continue our worship with with a time of prayer. O Lord, where the shadows of day stretch like an eclipse, clouding our hearts as with the darkness of night, may your words continue to bring light even amid the suffering and trouble. May we find hope and reflection in all that we read, for even on the darkest days, your love remains. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Psalm 22. Listen as the Spirit speaks. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, In you our ancestors trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried, and they were saved. In you they trusted, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm, and not human, scorned by others, and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth. And since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me. For trouble is near and there is no one, no one, no one to help. Many bowls encircle me, strong bowls of Bashan surround me, and they open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roaring lions. I am poured out like water. All of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a pot shard, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. And they stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves. And for my clothing, they are casting lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion.
listen again for the word of God from the Gospel of John. After Jesus had sat at table with his friends, the disciples, after they had shared a meal together, after Judas had left, Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew that place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there to that garden with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, Jesus asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside the gate. And so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You, you are not also one of this man's disciples. You, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I'm, I'm not. Now, the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter was also standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. And they asked him, You are not also one of the disciples, are you? And Peter denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. 
They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We're not permitted to put anyone to death. And this was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, Pilate went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? But the crowd shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Oh, hail the king of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, let, to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Here is the man. And when the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. Now the Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he is claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. So he entered his headquarters again, and he asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless that power had been given to you from above. Therefore, the only one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. Now when Jesus heard these words, or when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for Passover, and it was about noon. And so he said to the Jews, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away, away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. And they handed him over to then to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, 
and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took Mary into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. And a jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. Then, when Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. As Jesus proceeded to his death, he followed God's commandment to love us and to forgive us. It wasn't a half-hearted attempt to mend the world. Jesus' sacrifice was an intimate act, personal, love and grace-filled. The disciples, the guards, the temple leaders, they did not understand what was at stake. So they didn't apologize or ask for forgiveness, but they didn't have to. Jesus loved them already, and he forgave them. For Jesus' model of forgiveness was to forgive before an apology was made, even to forgive before the wrong was done. Jesus forgave creation for all that had ever been wrong when he rode into Jerusalem, when he carried his cross, and when he died forsaken. He did all of this without apologies or acknowledgments from anyone, and that is the heart of grace. Thomas Merton wrote, The person who was not afraid to admit everything that they see to be wrong with themselves and yet recognizes that they may be the object of God's love precisely because of their shortcomings, that person can begin to be sincere. And their sincerity is based on confidence, not in their own illusions about themselves, but confidence in the endless, unfailing mercy of God. When we can admit our faults and recognize God's love tucked around those faults, when we have confidence in the endless, unfailing mercy of God, 
our lives become steeped in gratitude. We see that we need Jesus, that we are actually dependent on Jesus. So it becomes a relief for us to ask God's forgiveness for our sinful burdens. And then receiving forgiveness creates a deep bond between God and us, for we all know the price. Then that forgiveness God extends to us frees us to love and serve others as Christ did. Surrounded in a fog of tragedy and violence, Holy Week these days are also steeped in love and grace and forgiveness. These days contain the best and worst of our relationship with God. The celebrations we have are not for anything we have done, but what was done for us. And we do not remember just what was done, but acknowledge what is still being done for us. We reflect on the ways that God continues to forgive us, continues to love us, and continues to offer us grace upon grace. As you draw nearer to the cross, may you be overwhelmed with the mercy present there. And may you then find ways to extend that mercy to others. Amen. Let us pray. Holy One, Holy Three, what you have done for the world astounds us and confuses us and sometimes becomes trite good news to us because we've heard it so many times. So we ask that you would open our eyes and our hearts and our ears today that we might see and hear and know what you are doing in a new way and that you would transform us once again with your love and mercy. On this Good Friday, we acknowledge many people in the world who feel forsaken, who feel abandoned, and who suffer pain beyond our own comprehension. So we pray that they would see you wherever they are, in the midst of war, in the midst of famine, in the midst of a sleepless night right here on our own streets, in the midst of a household or relationship fraught with violence, oh God, accompany them, accompany us so that we might trust that you are Emmanuel, God, with us wherever we are, and you have done this because you love us, to free us for life that's so much better, life that's what you intended. We pray also for those who are suffering from health concerns today, especially for our friend Tim Overstreet, and Ann Dobson's daughter-in-law, Deanna, both of whom have been in the hospital for cardiac events, and pray that your healing hand, your strengthening hand, would fall upon them. Hear us now as we pray silently for the needs and concerns we bring in our hearts today. And bind our prayers together with the one prayer that Jesus taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The prayer of confession on Good Friday has historically been done with these words in the solemn reproaches of the cross. You'll hear the voice alternating between the um, imaginary voice of God pulled directly from scripture at times and other times from the voice of the author, but then from the voice of the people acknowledging how people historically have sinned and how we today are sinning and furthering the divide between God and creation. So let us pray with humility and great faith. Oh, my people, oh, my church, what have I done to you? Or in what have I offended you? Answer me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism, but you prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty Lord, Holy, immortal one, have mercy on us. I led you through the desert 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penitence and gave you my body, the bread of heaven. But you prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy on us. What more could I have done for you that I have not done? I planted you, my chosen and fairest vineyard. I made you the branches of my vine. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. Before you in a pillar of cloud and you led me to the judgment hall of Pilate, I scourged your enemies and brought you to a land of freedom, but you scourged, mocked, and beat me. I gave you the water of salvation from the rock, but you gave me gall and left me to thirst, and you prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy on us. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you gave me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy on us. My peace I gave, which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a sign of my love. But you drew the sword to strike in my name and sought high places in my kingdom. I offered you my body and blood, but you scattered and denied and abandoned me, and you prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy on us. I sent the Spirit of truth to guide you, and you closed your hearts to the Counselor. I pray that all may be one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing, and you prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy on us. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen Israel, and you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt. And you prepared a cross for your Savior. Lord, have mercy on us. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me, and you prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty Lord, 
Holy, immortal one, have mercy on us. 